Alright guys, I'll just take one minute of your precious time. Just wanted to let all of you know that if you want to practice all these questions using artificial intelligence and practice on a portal which is as similar as your actual PT exam which will give you exact scores which you are likely to get in your exam, just register on languageacademy.com.au. You can practice as many questions. On top of that, you can get instant feedback, instant scores and instant suggestions on what are the things you need to work on and how to improve your mistakes and turn them into your strength. You can also take a full scored mock test. You'll get a full scorecard. You'll get in-depth analysis. You'll get tutors feedback. One mock test is available for free and four sectional mock tests are available for free. You just need to go on languageacademy.com.au, register over there. Use Google Chrome, log in and practice and make sure you get your desired score at the earliest. Now you can continue with the video or you can just log on to languageacademy.com.au and practice all these questions over there as well. All the very best. I'll see you very soon. Goa is very much influenced by the Portuguese. Their traditional work can be still seen there. The Portuguese are famous for preparing the loaves of bread. We can come across the bakers of bread. The writer tells about his childhood days in Goa when the baker used to visit their friend. He used to visit the house twice a day. In the morning, his jingling sound of the bamboo woke them from sleep. They all ran to meet him. The loaves were purchased by the manservant of the house. The villagers were much fond of the sweet bread known as bol. The marriage gifts were meaningless without it. So the baker's furnace in the village was the most essential thing. The lady of the house prepared sandwiches on the occasion of her daughter's engagement. In those days the bread sellers wore a particular dress known as kabai. It was a single piece long frock up to the knees. Deforestation is a process of planting trees or sowing seeds in barren lands so as to create a forest. It is also a process to plant more trees in an area where the number of trees has dwindled due to any reason, including deforestation. With increasing awareness of the significance of trees, many government and non-government agencies are coming forward to join in a forestation effort. The importance of trees is well known, as it is an important tool to improve upon the environment. It leads to betterment of the environment as well as quality of life, and gives forest produce in diverse forms which can be used in several industries. The number of trees has gone down due to increasing demand for wood for different purposes, especially fuel and timber. It is associated with several environmental problems, including depletion of the ozone layer and shortage of water due to decreased rainfall. Anger as a force in 1950s literature had its origins in a group known as the Movement. Deeply English in outlook, the Movement was a gathering of poets including Philip Larkin, Kingsley Amos, Elizabeth Jennings, Tom Gunn, John Wayne, D.J. Enright and Robert Conquest. The Movement can be seen as an aggressive, skeptical, patriotic backlash against the cosmopolitan elites of the 1930s and 1940s. The poets in the group rejected modernism, avant-garde experimentation, romanticism and the metaphorical fireworks of poets such as Dylan Thomas. Their verse was ironical, down-to-earth, non-sentimental and rooted in a nostalgic idea of English identity. 
European sympathies were regarded as unmistakable signs of intellectual pretentiousness and moral turpitude. The movement had members who were Oxbridge educated, Oxford and Cambridge white, predominantly male. Jennings was the only woman in the group. Computers are capable of doing extremely complicated work in all branches of learning. They can solve the most complex mathematical problems or put thousands of unrelated facts in order. These machines can be put to varied uses. For instance, they can provide information on the best way to prevent traffic jams. This whole process by which machines can be used to work for us has been called automation. In the future automation may enable human beings to enjoy more leisure than they do today. The coming of automation is bound to have important social consequences. Computers have been developed that are small enough to carry around in your bags. People are able to use their phones and laptops to obtain any information from anywhere in the world. For instance, people going on holiday can keep themselves informed about weather conditions. Discipline is one of the most important values. Discipline means self-control and spontaneous acceptance of proper code of conduct in the interest of collective life. Needless to say, every individual lives a life in two aspects one for himself and the other for his society. Now his sense of discipline teaches him how to make a healthy amalgamation of the two. Discipline claims a restraint on our willfulness and makes our freedom meaningful. It is a must in every part of life. A peaceful family or social life is impossible without disciplined conduct of the constituent members. Indiscipline causes disorder and nuisance. It destroys peace, progress and prosperity of the family, society and country. The term environment is derived from French word, environ, which literally means, surrounding, anything and everything which surrounds us i.e. all living beings or biotic components, microbes, plants and animals, and non-living or abiotic components, air, water, sunlight etc. present in the nature, form the environment. The Environmental Protection Act, 1986 defines environment as, environment includes water, air and land and the interrelationship which exists among and between water, air and land, and human beings, other living creatures, plants, microorganism and property. Interactions between the biotic and abiotic components lead to a functional ecosystem and sustainable life on the planet Earth. We get all the basic goods and services, clean air and water, food, fodder, medicines, raw materials for the industries, tourism etc., from the environment.
There are some special moments in life which we fondly nurture in our memory. My first day at school was one such event. It was a remarkable day in my life. After I grew to school going age, my parents decided to send me to a primary school in the neighborhood. I was a bit nervous at first. Father took me to school. The school building was small but beautiful. The headmaster was in his office. He asked my name and a few questions. He seemed satisfied with my answers. I was admitted to the nursery class. Soon after, father departed leaving me all alone in a strange world. I felt lonely in the midst of my classmates. But soon my fear and loneliness were overcome. A boy of my class became my friend. We talked a lot. After some time, a teacher entered the class. She was a beautiful young woman with a pleasing personality. She taught us how to sing a rhyme and dance to it. Man is a social being. He seeks company of others so that he can share his things, views and needs. The society comes into being from this urge of living together. A person wants somebody's company. A person with whom he can be closer at heart. With whom he can unlock his heart. With whom he can share his emotions and opinions. As such he is eager to make friends. Moreover, life for him is both joy and sorrow. He is to face both pleasures and pains. When he is faced with grief, his friends encourage him and give him a helping hand. They stand by him in weal and woe. Friendship is a sheltering tree for him. However, one must beware of false friends. Many people feign false friendship. Fake fair-weather friends mislead us for their selfish ends. However, true friendship depends upon trust and understanding, sympathy and love. It is one of the sweetest human relations. Global warming means that the rising temperature can bring about effects which could bring about extinction of life. It is expected that life has become extinct for seven times in the past 500 million years. The reasons for the earlier extinctions of life are not yet properly known, but the emission of harmful gases in the atmosphere is certainly going to wipe all species from the earth, hence the cause of concern. However, it is not being given a proper thought by those who are causing havoc with the ecosystem. The modern lifestyle has been a source of climatic and atmospheric conditions. The emissions and concentration of carbon dioxide has increased over 30% during the last 30 years chiefly due to industrial revolution. Rich countries are not willing to reduce these emissions. They argue that they would be faced with acute unemployment and diminishing of modern facilities. The word, theater, comes from the Greek theatron. Literally, seeing place, or, place where something is seen. The word was first used in its current form in 1576 when James Burbage named his playhouse the theater. Since Burbage's playhouse was one of the first, if not the first, structure built specifically for the production of plays, the name theater eventually came to mean first the buildings and then the entire genre. The companion term, drama, comes from the Greek word dran literally, to do. It is, something done. Frequently the terms are used interchangeably. Although the theater always refers to the structure where the performances are held as well as to the company of players who perform, theater also refers to the designers, administrators, technicians, etc. 
who work together to produce plays as well as the body of ideas that animates the artists and brings the plays to life. The Green Revolution refers to the period in 1960s which was characterized by the development and use of high-yielding varieties, HYV, of seeds which led to phenomenal increase in the output of food crops. Increased use of fertilizers and irrigation provided the increase in production needed to make India self-sufficient in food grains, thus improving agriculture in India. Hybrid high-yielding wheat was first introduced in India by Dr. Borlaug, who is also known as the father of the Green Revolution. Also, M. S. Swaminathan and his team contributed to make it a success. It led India reach a position when it could export food crops while maintaining a huge buffer stock for native consumption. India is mainly an agricultural country. However, the output was low due to lack of proper irrigation facilities, conventional and traditional approaches to farming. Knowledge is the most powerful tool that a human being possesses. What distinguishes man from beast is his ability to learn. His insatiable hunger for knowledge makes him act. He reads and invents, discovers and solves, and thus unravels mysteries existing around him and in the process stores knowledge in his mind. He is not satisfied until he has unveiled the unknown. Twin is the purpose of earning knowledge as it gives him joy and power. It empowers him to face the challenges of life. Knowledge emboldens him to bear with the stark realities of life with a calm of mind. It also gives him immense power by dint of which he masters the earth. It makes him immensely inventive. However, the power of knowledge is both constructive and destructive. He may do good to the society, humanity and environment. The uniqueness of Indian culture is its unity and diversity. India's cultural legacy shows that despite all kinds of differences, there exists a strong cord of unity which binds all Indians together. It is the dynamism and resilience of our culture that has sustained it for centuries despite its myriad diversities and differences. One of the hallmarks of our culture is that irrespective of the area or region we live in we all feel culturally connected. It is largely on account of similarity in ethos shared by people across the country on different occasions. For instance, the celebration of Lori and Basaki in Punjab, Bihu in Assam and Pongal in Tamil Nadu as harvesting festivals unites entire India with joyous feelings. T. S. Eliot emphasized that there are certain conditions which must be fulfilled before success can be achieved in this field. First, it must be realized that the difference between prose drama and verse drama is not merely one of medium. The themes of the two are 
and must be different. Poetic drama has been thought fit only for such themes as cannot be appropriately dealt with by the naturalistic prose drama T.S. Eliot writes, No play should be written in verse for which prose is dramatically adequate. The dramatic adequacy then demands a poignant theme, involving symbolic characters with imaginative atmosphere. This means a fallback on the elemental, emotional realities of life in contradistinction to the socio-economic issues which constitute the realm of the naturalistic prose drama. One of the major problems that faces the world today is the rapid growth of population. Until about 800 AD the world's population stayed below 200 million. Since then it has risen dramatically. The rise has been greatest in the 20th century. The population has risen to about 6 billion at present. It is three times as large as it was in 1960. It is not the actual population. But its rate of increase that is a cause of alarm. It was estimated to be 7 billion in 2012, and by 2040, it would be about 8 billion. Such a large population is bound to create many problems of different types. The increasing population means the need for more food, more schools, more houses, more civic facilities, more hospitals and more everything else. This enormous increase in population is due to better food, better hygiene and above all, the advances made in medical science. It is our way of thinking that makes us good or evil. A person with positive ideas does positive things in life. He thinks in terms of goodness and for the welfare of fellow beings, society and mankind at large. On the other hand, a person with negative thoughts thinks how he can derive maximum benefit through his mischief by making others suffer. A positive thinker ascends the heights of fame and is remembered years after he ceases to live. On the other hand, an evil person is despised by the contemporary people even, let alone the generations that follow. Even Hitler had to possess positive thoughts to ascend to the chancellorship of Germany. Only then his negative thoughts brought misery to the world and he made mankind suffer which ultimately brought his downfall. Noise pollution is one of the most serious evils that have been plaguing our life in different manifestations. It is a veritable nuisance to the urban people in particular. Noise pollution is mainly caused by the blowing horns of the automobiles, reckless use of loudspeakers and the bursting of crackers. Overpopulation and industrialization accelerate the rate of noise pollution. Aeroplanes too have a share in noise pollution in the affected zones. Environmentalists repeatedly warn us about the epidemic of nervous disorder to be caused by noise pollution. We can already find more and more people suffering from depression, and noise pollution is one of its important causes. But we pay little heed to their words. The Supreme Court has passed a directive to limit the level of noise pollution.
On Christmas Day there is a great feast in Dublin. This, you know, is the chief city of Ireland. The feast is made for the children. There are in that city a great many little ones who are very very poor. There are kind people there, also, who look after these poor children. They have what they call, ragged schools, where many of them are taught to read, and to sew, and other useful things. Dr. Nelliton is a famous minister in Dublin. And every year he, with other good people, gets up this great feast for the children. About 800 of them came last year. Some of these were only half clad. And all were very ragged. They were seated at long, narrow tables, which were covered with a white cloth. The children from the ragged schools wore aprons in bright colors to hide their rags. Addison visits the Westminster Abbey and amuses himself with the tombstones and inscriptions of the dead whenever he is in a serious mood. He notices that only the dates of birth and death are recorded without anything about the achievement of some men. He is reminded of persons mentioned in heroic poems who have high-sounding names given to them for no other reason than that they were knocked on their head. He thinks that incomplete records on the tombstone are a sort of satire upon the departed persons, during of this visit to the abbey, Addison entertained himself with the digging of a grave. He sees pieces of bones mixed up with a kind of fresh moldering earth. The dead bones and skulls of innumerable people lie under the pavement of that ancient cathedral. He considers how artificial distinction of caste and color are leveled up in the graveyard. Steele talks about the first gentleman of his company whose name is Sir Roger de Coverley. The people who knew about the county of Sir Roger knew Sir Roger. Sir Roger was a man of extraordinary nature and had a good sense. He always found fault with the ways of the world, but this unusual nature never made him any enemies. Sir Roger had a unique capacity to please others. Sir Roger was a bachelor because he was disappointed in the love of a beautiful widow. Before this disappointment Sir Roger was a normal happy young man. He moved in society of important persons like Lord Rochester and Sir George Etheridge. However, after being ill-used by the widow he lost all his joviality and interest in social life for more than a year. He became very serious. Gradually his joviality returned. However, he grew careless about his dress. He wore a coat and jacket of a cut, which was in fashion at that time. One major distinction between the manners in the town and the country is that many formalities and ceremonials, which once formed a part of civilized life in the city, but are no more in vogue now are still observed in the countryside. The mark of good breeding in the city now, says Addison, is the unaffected behavior rather than an over-formal courtesy. In the countryside good breeding is carried to ridiculous extremes. 
so that it becomes troublesome at social occasions like dinners as one is expected to sit according to the rigorous precedence of mark and status. A country gentleman might make one as many bows as would last courtier for a whole week. According to Addison, wives of country justices make more ado on this score than even duchesses. It does not matter that by the time the seating problem is resolved, the dinner might have become cold. Health is of utmost importance for human beings. To lead a healthy life, one should believe in healthy living. Healthy living can be attained by consuming healthy products and keeping away from products which are unfit for health. These days we find people consuming tobacco. It has become a habit and moreover a fashion. Chewing gutka or smoking is disastrous for health. Tobacco is the root cause of many diseases. The authorities should ban tobacco. It leads to cancer. Strict laws should be enforced on the sale of tobacco. Common public should be made aware of the ill effects of tobacco. People can be made aware about the negative impact of tobacco through TV commercials and cinema halls. This is essential as healthy public will create a healthy nation. One of the greatest curses that still plagues our world is child labor, where children below the age of 14 years are forced to work. This social evil is rampant in India, where a great number of children can be seen working at roadside stalls or dabas, or in brick mills, glass factories, firecracker factories, etc. When one looks towards the causes behind this practice, one finds that child labor is prevalent due to poverty, illiteracy, and the lack of urge to do better, etc. These poor children work as bonded laborers on a paltry wages. They rarely have sufficient food or clothing. Not only that, they are also ill-treated. There is no one who listens to them or cares for their woes. What people don't realize is that this has become a vicious circle. These children when grow up still remain backward, poor and illiterate. Their children go through the same horrible existence. These lines are proving true as the scarcity of water is catching on all around the world. This is the result of man's undue harvesting of the normal resource. We need water not only for our personal needs, but also for agriculture and industries. When there is plenty of water, we tend to waste it by leaving the taps running. Our carelessness leads to a lot of waste. We have to conserve each and every drop of water which is being wasted today. Schemes like water harvesting need to be launched on a big scale. Ecoclubs should be established in all the schools of the country to spread awareness among the students about the need to save environment.
Is that person really glad to see me? Or are they just being polite? Some people struggle to distinguish a fake grin from a truly happy smile. And computers have found this task even more difficult. That is, until researchers develop a program to detect when a smile is genuine. Visual computing researchers at the University of Bradford in the UK started with software for simulating a changing facial expression. This program can examine a video clip of a human head and identify specific details around the eyes, cheeks and mouth. Then the program tracks the details moving relative to each other as the face smiles. Next, the scientists had their program analyzing two sets of video clips. In one, subjects performed posed smiles. This is the story of a tribal boy who was not content with the life he had. He was loved by all. But he was not happy. His father saw that something troubled him. He asked his son the reason. He said to his father that he wanted to be an archer. He wanted to be the disciple of a great teacher who taught only the sons of kings. He said to his father that he knew they belonged to hunting tribe. He did not want to be a mere hunter. He approached the teacher and asked the teacher to train him to be a mighty warrior. The great teacher rejected his plea, saying that this place belongs only to king's sons. Though he was dejected, he did not lose hope. He made a statue of the great teacher and started worshipping him. He believed if he could practice before his teacher he would learn archery. It is difficult to know how to place Montesquieu if you're the kind of person who likes to categorize historian, political philosopher, sociologist, jurist or if you think the Persian letters a novel, a novelist he was all these things, perhaps, as some have, he could be placed among that almost extinct species, the man of letters the books that make up, the spirit of the laws have had the most influence on later thinkers, and in them as in his equally great considerations on the causes of the grandeur and decadence of the Romans. He makes his underlying purpose clear. It is to make the random, apparently meaningless variety of events understandable. He wanted to find out what the historical truth was. His starting point then was this almost endless variety of morals, customs, ideas, laws and institutions and to make some sense out of them. There have been many studies in America of the opinions and behavior of university lecturers and professors, and of well-known, free, or public thinkers who are not attached to a university or other institution, which show that those who are recognized as being more successful or productive as scholars in their field, or are at the best universities, are much more likely to have critical opinions, that is to say that they are more likely to hold liberal views in the American use of that word than those of their colleagues who are less creative or who have less of a reputation. The better a university is, as measured by the test results of its students or by the prestige of its staff, the more likely it has been that there will be student unrest in a relatively left of center faculty.
What I am trying to say is that the appeal and the settlement are separate. You mean that communications and announcements internal and external would be brought into the appeal process? Right, because they connect to the appeal. I hope you understand there are issues of reputation, and I have to deal with those in the appeal process rather than the commercial issues around settlement. And then, there is this legal claim for defamation. I believe that the implication would be to perceive in for defamation. Yes, I will investigate to what we have as written evidence and what we do not have. Okay, great. I am thankful for you to do that. There are some 250 million cars in America. 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen electricity, biofuels, and digital technology. And they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. Social harm originates out of a series of debates within criminology about the narrowness of the definition of crime that essentially focuses on individual acts of harm, things like interpersonal violence, theft, so on and so forth. So the idea of social harm originally was to expand that notion of harm to encompass the harms that organizations and nation states cause. But latterly the idea of social harm really now transcends criminology so there are a group of writers who think that and I would include myself there that actually there's something to social harm that could be very useful in terms of trying to understand the harms that occur within society to produce an objective and well-rounded analyses of harm. The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may best discern the true interests of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves. 
convened for the purpose. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moves smoothly. But soon, the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track. But the jam spread backward around the track, like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real-life jams move backward at about the same speed. It was late in December. Darkness increased the danger as also his gloom and despair. He sank down on the ground as he was quite tired. He heard the sound of hammer strokes. He summoned all his strength, got up and staggered in the direction of the sound. He reached a forge where the master smith and his helper sat near the furnace waiting for the pig iron to be ready to put on the anvil. There were many sounds big bellows groaned, burning coal cracked, the fire boy shoveled charcoal with a great deal of clatter, the waterfall roared. A sharp north wind whipped the rain against the brick-tiled roof. On account of all these noises the blacksmith did not notice that Amal had opened the gate and entered the forge until the stranger stood close up to the furnace. Our body and brain recover from fatigue after a good sleep. We dream while sleeping. But we do not always remember our dreams. During sleep, our heartbeat becomes slower and our temperature and blood pressure go down. A dream is an activity of the mind when we are asleep. Dreams help us sleep through noise and other disturbances. Dreams may reveal something about one's problems. But they cannot tell the future. What is sleep? Sleep is actually a state of rest. Our body and brain recovers from the fatigue of the activities of the day. While we are in deep sleep, our muscles relax, our heartbeat becomes slow and our temperature and blood pressure also goes down. We also dream when we are sleeping. A dream is an activity of the mind during sleep. Some dreams are believable. Some are not. Dreams sometimes reveal about one's problems. But they cannot predict the future. One morning Aram is awakened before dawn by his 13-year-old cousin Murad. 
who is thought to be demented by everyone except Aram, and has a way with animals. Aram is astonished to see that Murad is sitting on a beautiful white horse. Aram has always wanted to ride a horse, but his family is too poor to afford one. However, the Garoglanian tribe is noted not only for its poverty but also for its honesty. So it is unthinkable that Murad would have stolen the horse. So, Aram felt that his cousin couldn't have stolen the horse. Aram was invited to ride on the horse with Murad. The idea of Murad stealing the horse drained away from Aram's mind as he felt that it wouldn't become stealing until they offered to sell the horse. They enjoyed their riding on the horse for a long time. Cricket grew out of the stick and ball games played in England 500 years ago. It is played with a bat which means stick or club. Till the 18th century bats were shaped like hockey sticks. The reason was that the ball was bowled along the ground. The strange feature of cricket is that a test match can go on for five days and still remain undecided. A football match is over in an hour and a half. Another notable thing of cricket is its pitch. It has to be 22 yards in length. But there is no limit on the dimension of the playing ground as in hockey or football. Cricket grounds differ greatly in size. Laws of cricket were first drawn up in 1744. It has two umpires. The stumps are 22 inches high. And the ball across them is 6 inches. Evelyn was 11 years old when it was discovered that she had a hearing problem. She wanted to pursue her career in music but her teachers discouraged her. It was Ron Forbes who recognized her potential and supported her. He advised her not to listen through her ears but try to sense it in some other way. This proved to be the turning point. She learned to open her body and mind to the sounds and vibrations. After that she never looked back. She had mastered the art of interpreting different vibrations of sound on her body. She joined the prestigious Royal Academy of Music and scored the highest marks in the history of the Academy. She worked hard and with determination stood against all odds and got right to the top. In 1991, she was presented with the Royal Philharmonic Society's prestigious Soloist of the Year Award. Once upon a time, there was a man who went around selling small rat traps of wire. He made them himself but his business was not profitable. So, he had to beg and steal a bit to survive. His clothes were in rags. His cheeks were sunken and hunger could be noticed in his eyes. The world had never been kind to him. His life was sad and monotonous. He had no home, no shelter. One day, he was struck by an idea that the whole world was nothing but a big rat trap. As pork and cheese serve as baits to trap rats, the world offered lands, clothes, foods, joys and riches to trap people. As soon as anybody touched them the trap closed on them. He was mused to think of some people who were already trapped and some others who were trying to reach the bait.
Now crack your PTE sitting at your home. Language Academy brings to you the smartest AI-powered practice portal, with instant scores and feedback for all the tasks. Along with the practice questions, access free sectional and full mock tests, and get instant scorecard with in-depth feedback and analysis. For more hidden secrets, tips, strategies, and proven templates, click the link below and subscribe to our video course today.